This is a specialized Roval Terra carbon gravel handlebar. It costs $250 US and is claimed to weigh just 200 grams for a size 42 centimeter. There's a mild flare of 12 degrees in the drops and there's a nice flat ergonomic top section as well. Now this is a Ritchie Comp Butano 6061 aluminum alloy handlebar. It costs $64 US and is claimed to weigh 310 grams for a size 42 centimeter. There's a mild flare of 18 degrees in the drops and there's also a nice flat ergonomic top section. They both accommodate fully internal cable routing if desired and they're both what you would consider a short and shallow bar which is very well suited for gravel use. So why pay nearly four times the amount for the Roval when the Butano offers nearly the same specs at a fraction of the price? Perhaps for some, the weight savings alone justifies the extra expense, but for many of us, myself included, we've been trained to correlate carbon components with that elusive property of vibration damping. That is, carbon fiber is compliant and therefore comfortable, while aluminum alloy is stiff and harsh. In this video, we put that theory to the test and we'll discuss some data that shows that carbon bars don't necessarily absorb any more vibration than their significantly cheaper alloy counterparts. That's right, it's another bike science video and we're gonna get a little bit nerdy today. So the experiment that I ran is as follows. The test bike was my specialized crux with the alloy Ritchie Butano handlebar installed first. An accelerometer data logger measuring at a sample frequency of 370 hertz or 370 measurements per second was fixed to the handlebar as close to the rider hand position on the hoods as possible. That's where the vibrations are felt by the rider's hands. Now I did one road test on a half mile smooth asphalt mildly declined road of about negative 3% grade, and then another test on a rougher half mile dirt fire road with a downhill grade of negative 5%. I ran these tests with no bar tape installed to eliminate vibration damping from bar tape as a variable. Then I swapped the handlebar to the Carbon Roval Terra with everything else being identical. And I did this in the parking lot over the course of about five or 10 minutes so that all the testing could be done on the same day within a few minutes of each other so that the weather, the temperature, air pressure, my tire pressure, my weight, etc., would all be consistent. Then with the new carbon bars installed, I ran the same road and dirt tests again for a total of four data sets, two on road and two on the dirt. Now each experimental run was about 80 seconds long, but I chopped off the very beginning where I was coming up to speed, and I also chopped off the very ends where I was slowing down to a stop. The cleaned up data represents about 65 seconds of steady state data, where I was riding at a target speed of 18 miles per hour. And keep in mind, sampling at a rate of 370 hertz gives us about 24,000 data points per experimental run. The following plot here shows the data in the time domain. In other words, this is a plot of the raw data measuring acceleration in Gs versus time in seconds. On the left, we have the road data with the Butano data in red and the Roval Terra data in blue. On the right, this is the dirt descent data, again with the Butano in red and the carbon Terra handlebars in blue. In all cases, we find that the data is centered about negative one on the y-axis. Now this, of course, is evidence that we selected the proper vertical data channel coming out of the three-axis data logger. And it kind of serves as a sanity check since we do live in a gravitational environment where the acceleration due to gravity, by definition, is negative one g. Now in general, a lower accelerometer measurement corresponds to a smoother ride as there is less acceleration felt by the rider. It's why both road data sets are so much lower in amplitude than the rowdier dirt data. However, beyond the visual inspection, there's actually very little you can discern about the vibration damping properties of the handlebars by looking at the data in the time domain. Now I'm actually gonna cut over to a quick explainer about why the time domain isn't the best for visualizing vibrational data and why the frequency domain is a much better option. Okay, so before I put up the actual data, I do need to explain the concept of something called the frequency domain because it's kind of what makes this experiment work. So if you look at a single sine wave, it looks like what you remember from high school math class. And this is what the signal looks like in the time domain. Notice the x-axis is time. However, in what's called the frequency domain, a single sine wave looks a little bit different. Now this is called a power spectral density plot, or PSD, and it's a plot not in the time domain, but rather in the frequency domain. Note the x-axis is frequency of oscillation and not time. Now in this plot, the same sine wave that we just saw is a single spike at the frequency of oscillation. The plot is really 
really just an indication of the amount of power in a given signal as a function of frequency. So for instance, let's go back to the time domain and now look at a signal that contains two pure sine waves at different frequency. It looks a little bit weirder, but this is what it looks like in the time domain. In the frequency domain, however, as you might have guessed, the same signal is represented as two distinct spikes at their respective frequencies. Now this type of plot, the PSD, is much more useful when you're analyzing vibrational data because a typical vibration signal like the ones collected on the trail are not one or two perfect sine waves but rather they look more like a crazy cluster of seemingly random vibrations. Now it was Fourier who came along in the early 1800s and showed us that any stationary periodic signal can be broken down into some linear combination of many perfect sine waves through something called the Fourier transform. And that's really the key here. Crazy looking vibrational signal that looks like this in the time domain might actually look like this in the frequency domain. Now in this hypothetical example here, we have two vibrational signals that look virtually the same in the time domain, but once you look at them in the frequency domain, we can reveal that one signal has a lot of power in the lower frequency range, and the other has more power in the higher frequency bandwidth. And so with that extremely brief introduction into the frequency domain, we can now look at some of the data from our experiment. So that was a little clip from the vibrational analysis video on hardtail frame compliance that I did a while back, but the exact same principles apply here as well when testing handlebars. So clearly I tend to favor the frequency domain for analyzing vibration data, but before we fully dive in, there is one thing that you can take away from the time domain data. Now the root mean squared or RMS value of a time domain signal sort of gives a normalized value that corresponds to the relative amount of energy in the signal. Now in our time domain plots here, I've actually gone ahead and calculated the RMS values for all the data sets. In the road test, the RMS value for the alloy butano bars is 1.0324, while the RMS for the carbon tera bars is 1.0475 which means the RMS value for the carbon tera bars is actually 1.5% higher than the alloy bars, suggesting that the carbon bars are just slightly more harsh than the alloy bars. Now, 1.5% may seem insignificant, and it probably is, but we're certainly not seeing any significant vibration damping from the carbon handlebar, at least as far as the RMS values are concerned. Now this is even more pronounced when we look at the data from the dirt descent. The RMS value for the alloy butano bars is 2.1866, while that of the carbon tera bars is again higher at 2.3228, representing a 6.2% increase over the alloy bars, again indicating that the carbon bar is actually absorbing less vibrational energy than the aluminum alloy bar. But again, this is a time domain analysis and the RMS value only gives us a single value with which to compare data sets. So let's now jump into the frequency domain plots here and take a look at the power spectra for all the data. Again, on the left we have the road data and on the right we have the dirt data with the red plots representing the alloy butano bars and the blue data sets representing the carbon tera bars. Now, very similar to the MTB frame compliance video, we again observe a pretty distinct bandwidth between about 10 to 50 hertz where most of the vibrational power exists. What this means is that all of this data above about 50 hertz is actually relatively insignificant compared to that 10 to 50 hertz bandwidth as it's anywhere between 10 decibels lower than the primary bandwidth for the road data to about 20 decibels lower for the dirt data. Now for the road data, let's zoom in on the primary bandwidth. If either bar had a vibration damping property over the other, we'd see it here in this bandwidth represented as a region of frequencies where the power of one data set was lower than the other. In this case here, they're all but identical. Now, the relative jaggedness in these PSD plots here is due to something called the NFFT window, which is an adjustable parameter in the code, but if it were more coarse than it is, we'd lose out on some of the resolution, and if it were more fine, the data would look too noisy to pull out any trends. Essentially, this PSD confirms the fact that the RMS values for both bars are pretty much the same which means ultimately that neither bar is any better at damping out vibrations than the other. Now, if we look at the dirt data, it's basically the same story. The PSDs for the alloy and carbon handlebars in the primary bandwidth basically look the same. But recall that the carbon bars actually have a slightly higher RMS value, and if you look carefully in the sort of 25 to 35 hertz bandwidth, 
there are a couple of spots where it does appear that the carbon Terra handlebars have a slightly higher power in the signal than the alloy butano, which could partially explain the higher overall RMS. So all of this to say, Sure, it was just one day of testing with one data set per configuration, but the data does seem to show that, in this case at least, this particular carbon handlebar is no better at reducing vibrations than a much more affordable alloy handlebar. And the data does agree with my experience. Even before I analyzed the data, during the testing, I honestly couldn't feel any difference between the two handlebars as far as compliance goes. Now this is despite a lot of online reviews claiming to feel the compliance and some magical vibration damping properties when upgrading to the Carbon Terra handlebars. So I'm left kind of wondering if what those people online felt was placebo or perhaps they truly started off with an extremely harsh handlebar and the Terra actually did feel more compliant? I don't really know, but what I do know is that marketing people are very good at what they do, and so the claim that carbon fiber is more compliant than alloy is a huge and frustrating blanket statement that may be true in some cases, but certainly not in all scenarios. Now I know that Richie spends a lot of time tuning the budding profiles of their alloy and steel tubes, and the alloy butanol handlebars here use a budded alloy tubing, so it is possible that the butanos are actually relatively compliant when compared to other alloy handlebars. It's also possible that the carbon Roval Terra handlebars, being that they're designed for performance and racing, are actually designed to be extra stiff, which is something that pros and high performing cyclists tend to want. So again, I think there's a lot more nuance than just saying carbon fiber is more compliant than alloy. All I really know is that I paid $250 for a carbon handlebar upgrade that basically feels identical to an alloy handlebar that costs a fraction of the price. Now, sure, I saved about 100 grams off the weight of the bike, and maybe for some that's enough to justify the extra cost. In my case though, I'm left a little bit conflicted. Carbon stuff can definitely make the bike feel nicer, and it certainly has a bling factor, but if it's not going to deliver on its primary value proposition of absorbing more vibrations than aluminum alloy, then I'm not sure it's worth the steep jump in price. Now, what I don't want to happen is for you to start generalizing this study. If your immediate reaction is to apply this logic to carbon versus alloy frame sets, for instance, and use it as a soapbox for why metal frames are better than carbon, well then that's just adding to the problem of spreading generalizations in the cycling space. All I really want from these science-y type videos is for the cycling community to adopt a slightly more discerning frame of reference when considering what bikes or components you wanna use. Basically, the takeaway here is Ride what feels right for you and your budget, and don't let the marketing hype convince you that you need that next fancy carbon upgrade. At the end of the day, it's just bikes, and bikes are supposed to be fun. All right, well there you go, another semi sciency video comparing vibrational data between an alloy handlebar and a carbon handlebar, and you made it through all the way to the end. That's awesome. Honestly, I'm not even gonna ask you to subscribe, I'm just happy you made it all the way to the end of this video. So yeah, I guess I'll see you in the next one. Yeah. What a dumb way to end the video.